Oh, wow. It's okay. working. Got it. It's fine. Uh, fine. Super. So we can start whenever you're ready. I'm ready. Whenever yeah, well, I'm rolling. We're ready. Eh? Okay. So, um, welcome to Into the Pit. We're here with Paul Speckman of uh, Master Death Strike Abomination, Speckman Project, Johansson and Speckman, and yeah, yeah, Rabbit Thor. Uh, <laughs> Rabbit Thor as well. Yeah, so, yeah, the list goes on. Yeah, the list goes on. <laughs> That's okay. I've been working, you know, I've been working for a long time and working really hard. And, you know, the, the one good thing I'd like to say is that, you know, I'm still enjoying myself and I'm still out there working. I just came back from a tour. I mean, it's still happening, so I guess I'm doing something right, you yeah? know? Definitely. you gotta, you got to stick with it eh? and um, do what you love, I guess, eh? definitely. So tell me, how has the, uh, it's been a crazy two plus year, two and a half, yeah, I think it's two and a half, almost three years now for everybody. Um, how did the pandemic treat you? Like shit. <laughs> you know, in... Uh, in 2020, I got COVID and I didn't know it, to be mm. honest. That, you know, I, I really didn't pay attention to it. I just I just thought I was sick or whatever, you know. Yeah. I, I ended up going to, uh, I think I went to Tesco or something. This was like Christmas Eve, you know, and um, I did a quick shop. And I'll admit, there was a shitload of people in there and I was a little bit nervous about it. COVID had just started, you know, taking effect everywhere around Czech. But on the other hand, I thought, oh, nothing could happen to me. You know, I'm, I'm Superman. <laughs> That's what we all think, yes. So anyway, I got home and, uh, I, you know, I, I did a quick shot. I went to the gym. I worked out in the afternoon, which, again, is unusual. I usually work out in the mornings. But this particular day, uh, um, the tw I think it was the 24th or whatever, I, uh, I went to the gym in the afternoon. I did a quick shot on the way home. And I said to my wife that I've been kind of feeling sick today. I said, I don't know what happened. I said, on the treadmill and I started feeling like dizzy and sick and stuff and really unusual and my wife said I've been feeling sick all day too and I went oh shit okay so anyway we stayed home you know we had our uh, our, uh, our Christmas Eve and Christmas Day dinners or whatever you want to say and and uh, fortunately for us uh, we didn't lose our taste uh, our taste or whatever everyone said that when they got COVID you lose the taste yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. didn't happen to me and my wife I kept eating normally the whole time Anyway, so over the next uh, six to seven weeks, I stayed home from the gym because I just said to my wife, you know, uh, you know, I was sneezing and coughing and stuff, and I had a fever for like 10 days or something, on yeah. and off, up and down, up and down. And I said, I better stay away from the gym. I don't want to get anybody sick there. I still didn't put two and two together. I only found out that I had COVID like uh, maybe six months ago. I went in for a couple of blood tests just to make sure I'm healthy and stuff and okay. And the lady said, did, did you know you had COVID last year? You, you still have a few antibodies left. And I went, Oh shit. And I told my wife, I guess we had COVID. Maybe we should have gone in for a test, but I still thought at that time, ah, oh, who cares? It can happen. Okay. So going back to what I wanted to say, but the one thing I will say is during the time I had the COVID, I recorded uh, the new uh, uh, Johansson Speckman vocals. And I also recorded all the Speckman Project vocals while I was sick. I was going to the studio, you know, stick. I just didn't feel real well, and I was going in every week, uh, uh, maybe twice on uh, twice a week on Tuesday and, and Thursday. I was going in and singing two songs on both of these records. So even though I was sick, I finished both of those albums at that time. And looking back on it now, I'm not saying it was easy, but when I listened to the records. They still sound good, so I guess the vocals they ended up okay. I, I didn't know, maybe that's why, you know. <laughs> Crazy time, anyway. So anyway, it was shitty. Sitting home for two years was a living hell, I'm sure, for everybody else. Luckily, uh, about ten days ago, I just finished up my latest tour. We finally went on tour. I did a nice, uh, nice German festival in, in Heidelberg, the Heidelberg Death Fest. This was a blast. It was like the first time I'd. Been with people. There was like, a, I don't know, 800, 900 people, something like that. It was a nice audience, you know, and they were ready, just like all the bands were ready to accept it and see it and live it again. And oh, it was a great time. Then uh, a week later, I went on tour in Spain and Portugal. Again, we had a great time. It was 10 shows in 11 days. And in Spain and Portugal, you saw some masks, let's say in the beginning of the show, 
in some places, but some of the other places, there were no masks at all, you know, so it was wide open and the shows were great. And again, the people really appreciated it. Merch sales were great. And I had a blast, you know, I gotta be honest with you. It was great to get back on stage 11 times after <laughs> over two years. I believe you. It's, it's so many people I've spoken to, they said it was it was such a relief uh, being on stage again and um, just getting it out there again. And yeah, I mean, there are bands that do the band thing as a side thing, and then there are bands that really rely on it, you know. And um, and I'm one of those guys that that is all I do. All I yeah. do. I, I admit, I go to the gym three days a week, which I will start again next week anyway. I haven't been back. But anyway, I go to the gym three days a week, and uh, my biggest job is going to the post office. I have bags of merchandise <laughs> to the post office. Yeah. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I go to the gym. Then I go to the post office. So thankfully for Master or for me, whatever you want to say, I'm busy as hell selling merch every week. I may have like a shitty week. Every, let's say, 15 or 16 weeks, I may have one bad week. But normally, this whole two years, I had to run to the post office three times a week, every week. So at least people support the band. And basically, I can say I live from the music. Okay, It's not a hobby for me. Okay, shows are more important because you can sell more stuff. But on the other hand, thankfully, this job of going to the post office, well, it's not so bad, you know. <laughs> Not a not a bad job, right? okay. I felt the same way. Um, being locked in, and you know, you can't go to shows. And I, I spent a lot. I actually reviewed the the COVID time when we had lockdown here in Germany, and uh, I think I haven't bought as many LPs and merch for a long time. <laughs> and I started that again during the pandemic. And I said, well, you know, time to entertain myself again and and, and actually get the get the articles, the real deal again, you know. But that's what I want to say is that for some reason I had luck. Maybe not everybody had luck, but I'm just saying yeah. that so many people were home during the pandemic that more people are buying the stuff for me, well, you know, or from me. That's all I can say. So I was lucky that there are actual fans out there that still purchase Speckman products. That's all I can yeah. say. And I'm happy yeah. about that. And I say thank you to the fans, of course. Absolutely. Because they came alive and, you know, that's all right. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Did, 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 does Czech have any, or did they have any uh, grants for musicians and artists during the pandemic? No idea. I don't know. Because they did that in Germany here, and I just saw an interview with Schmier from Destruction, and he said right. he's, he's so glad he never uh, accepted that, because what seemed uh, to be a grant at first quickly turned around to be, uh, well, now you can pay us back. <laughs> uh -huh, okay. <laughs> That just so shows you. So maybe on the other hand, it's great that I don't understand the language so well over here because I didn't read about that or talk yeah. about it with anybody. Yeah. I just had to fight for myself, which I've been doing for 30 years. So whatever. It's okay. Best you just stick to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so that, that's good to hear. You guys are uh, active again live. That would have been my next question. Um, um, a um, uh, uh, curious question. What brought you to the Czech Republic? And, okay. um, and I need to say, I need to say, I need to say, go ahead. I need to say one thing because I have been in Hurerska Rabiska before. Ah, really? Uh, with um, Bruno and uh, the Krabbethor guys. Okay, cool. That's when we, we played together with them at, uh, when we started our tour. Uh, I used to be in a South African band called Voice of Destruction. Okay. And we did a tour with them, uh, a sort of like a warm-up tour, two, three dates before we joined the other tour. But anyway, a uh, lovely place. Really enjoyed it there. Great. And, you know, I've, I've been here in Wereskadadisha. You said it really good, too. Um, <laughs> I've been in Wereskadadisha for 22 years now. Awesome. Oh, 22 so nice. years. You know, you've been here. I love it. I fell in love with the place right away. It's like... Uh, I got that opportunity to join Kravathor when Bruno quit the band. We uh, we did that tour, I think it was in 1999, I believe. It might have been 1999. It was 44 concerts. Uh, oh, hold on. I have to think about it. I think it was 37 concerts in 42 or 44 days, maybe. Not so many days off. But anyway, this was a kind of, sort of thing. It was Malevolent Creation, Master, and Kravathor. 
And the only reason why Kravathor was on the tour is because Vader got a different offer. This is a long time ago. So Vader canceled and Kravathor came in. And obviously that was a break for me because it changed my life. So we did these concerts on an old school bus with a German company, uh, Impact Records. Anyway, System Shock Impact Records. It was like yes, a yes, yes. Well, Whatever. They took us on the road, like I said, and uh, either you hated each other or you got along with each other after 44 days. There were like well, there was no toilet on the bus. It was really like an old American school bus with shitty beds that fell apart. You know, you'd fall down on top of each other. Things are better today, you know, but back in the day, really shitty, circ dire circumstances. But we made it. And anyway, after the tour, um, Bruno decided he was going to go solo with his band Hypnos. He wanted to do a new band. And then I got the opportunity and, and Christopher called me in, in Arizona and said, you know, Paul, we're looking for a bass player. We really liked you and got along really well with you. Would you be interested in coming to check for a couple of months and seeing if you like it? We have a tour in Japan right away. So that was my offer. So of course I came, you know, what, you know, what, what guy wouldn't travel for his music with an opportunity like that? I mean, okay, not everybody, let's just say, but I went for it, you know, and uh, here I am, you know, here I am 22 years later, still in check and I'm still happy. And I actually, when I, uh, when I left Arizona in Arizona, I was still really working hard, moving furniture, you know, and I came to check and, I did this tour. I ended up staying the summer or whatever. And then I went back again. I worked some more, sold all my furniture, all my stuff, and moved to Czech for good. And I never went back. And the thing about Europe for me was I got more respect in Europe, and that's why I'm still working today. For some reason, in the early days in America, I had really hard times. You know, a lot of the bands were more successful than we were. We were one of the beginning bands, whatever you want to say, one of the originators, maybe you could say. But point is, we didn't have much success. For me, uh, the idea was to come to Europe where I knew people liked me and would give me a chance. And still today, we're playing concerts and festivals, and it's okay. Yeah. That's actually quite interesting because I wanted to ask you, I mean, do you, number one, miss the U.S.? And number two, how did it treat you? But you very basically answered that. And what that amazes me because um, you were there right from the start. I mean, possessed uh, Chuck Schulder and his early death sort of the originators of the whole movement. For some reason, we didn't get much respect out there. And we we certainly weren't touring. We were only doing a couple of shows. I think we did maybe two shows in Chicago or maybe three in my whole career up to that point yeah. in the early days. I really didn't start playing until 1990 on that, that uh, Master of Pungent Stench and Abomination Tour. That's really what started everything for me. And, you know, and, that, and that, I could never look back after that, you know. That was the beginning of it all for me, 1990, really. The yeah. early 80s, nothing was really happening. Yeah, we recorded a demo and and shopped it around and made some mistakes and whatever, but nothing really started really happening for me until a nuclear blast signed us in 1990. That was the beginning of my career, quote unquote, and that's why I'm still here today. Thank you, Marcus Steiger and Slotko. Rest in peace, of course. No, oh, but um, uh, I think you're right. Uh, the, the European audiences are probably not as fickle as in the U.S. You know, it's they're more loyal. That's uh, at least that's what I hear from a lot of people. Yeah, that they yeah, I, stick to a band and, and 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 sort of. It's not not always the sort of flavor of the week kind of thing, you know. Yeah, and and, and there, you mentioned that, and that's a reality too. Is that we've never been a flavor of the week, even today. <laughs> you like. <laughs> Yeah, even today I'm playing the same style that I was playing 30 years ago. I haven't changed really much at all. I hope I'm not saying anything wrong when I say it's like for me. It's, what? For me, you're like the motorhead of death metal. You know, it's like thank you sticking to the gun. And I think it's important to I think it's important to stick to your to your guns and stick to your original idea. Who wants to be the flavor of the day? I mean, not me. Oh no, no, no. No, that's, what I, that's what I always said to people. A lot of people you know, like to talk shit and say, oh, yeah, uh, the new Master Elm. That sounds like the Master Elm 20 years ago. Well, you know, it's called style. You know what I mean? It's like exactly. I always said when you, know, you can always tell when Motorhead came on the radio, let's say on an underground program, yes. or, or you put a Motorhead album on, you always knew it was Lemmy from the sound of the bass right away. You knew it was Lemmy. 
And 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 you well, have to say that some of the Lemmy wrote some of the same songs over and over, in my opinion, with different words and you know different tempos, but some of the same riffs over and over. So what? It's called style. And a lot of people don't understand that. They're always changing their style around. And what does ACDC do? I mean, you know, it's... Exactly. They sing you know, the ACDC right away from, from the first, the second chord, maybe, you know? Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. Yeah. And, it's, and I think that's an art in itself to, to sort of actually maintain that and, and uphold that for decades. And, and actually, I always, as a fan... I come a little bit from the marketing perspective because I'm a graphic designer, but yeah. um, I always think, you know, whether it's a deer side, whether, whether it's an overkill album or if I buy overkill, would you, I want that product to be inside. <laughs> you know, I don't want, yeah, you're not looking, you're not looking I, for I don't want to buy a, a, a Coke can and, and there's like orange juice in it, you know? That's, <laughs> so, <laughs> and it's not like Coca-Cola tastes different every 10 years. It's, yeah, exactly. exactly. And that's exactly what I, it, it might sound a bit blunt, but it's it's what I expect from a master album, from a possessed album, from a whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah, I understand. I agree with you. That's a good analogy. <laughs> yes, it's and it's a, I hate to I hate to reduce music to a product, but in a way, that's how you act when when you know something new comes on the scene or a new album gets announced. And yeah, I got you. Yeah, um, you're hoping it's still heavy. Yes, of course. You're hoping it didn't lose their path, you know. Now that we're bringing in some, we're bringing in some jazz elements, you know. Yeah, exactly. I got we'll, you. We'll spin the top. <laughs> no, but that's good to hear. So. Crabathor for you was a, a one album thing, and uh, I, I believe from what I heard from Bruno, uh, uh, Christopher disappeared. Yeah, it was actually, I, I actually did two albums with him. Hmm. Yeah. I did, uh, the first one was called Unfortunately Dead. Yes. And the second one was Discwayed Truth. But yeah, okay. Christopher, yeah, Christopher did disappear. He decided to move to America. I came, you know, like he wanted to stay in America and I came to Czech Republic. So we kind of like that movie. We traded places, you know? Yeah. I live in Orange County. And then he lived, he was living in Chicago and then in Arizona. And Please, then uh, uh, worse. He, exactly what you did. <laughs> yeah. And eventually he got married a few years ago. He got married and he's, I think he's in Portland now. I'm pretty sure. Okay. And he's happy. He's, you know, married and happy and doing his thing. He, He's not, I don't think he's doing music anymore. I haven't heard from him in quite, quite, quite a few years, really. But more yeah, power to the guy. I respect the guy. And he was a really loyal and good friend to me for many years. You know, I had nothing bad to say about him. And actually, you know, Bruno and I, we, we reconnected too over the years. And we see each other from time to time. And he invites me to do a poem on his latest records. The last yes, record. I heard. And uh, Very cool. I'm, you know, and I come and do that. I'm more than willing to help my friend. Yeah, whatever. We we knew each other, we've known each other for many years. You know, you know. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that awesome, awesome, awesome piece of history there. No, I just I just um, I followed Krabathor up until I think the albums you did, and then I sort of lost perspective as well. And I, I don't think anything much happened. And then Bruno came with Hypnos. Um, yeah. With the band, I, I didn't quite have them on my screen in the beginning. It's only later that I caught up now with the albums. And yeah, kudos that he's also still at it. You know, and it's good to see. Yeah, he's still kicking ass. So you, uh, the, your first album was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, recorded at Morris Sound. No, actually, the first uh, master album was recorded in Chicago, then uh, remixed remastered and the drums were triggered at Morris Sound. Ah, okay. That explains it. What Nuclear Blast wanted to do and they were the they were the ones with the money, so you know, you kind of had to go with them. The only thing that was kind of sad is that uh you know, uh he they did the remixes and remastering in Florida without us, of course, and and I remember calling Scott Burns to tell him that hey, you know, you Missed the whole solo section on this song, and he said to me, "Oh, it's too late." You know, kind of disappointed. He kind of told me that he was only in it for the money at that time. You know, at that time he was getting pretty famous and was only in it for that hundred dollars an hour the studio was getting. You know, 
Yeah, I think he just uh, churned them out back then, eh? Yeah, I mean, whatever. Time goes on, you know. And actually, uh, somebody wrote me last week, to be honest with you, about this. Asked me if uh, they're doing a, a book on uh, on Scott Burns and they're you know interviewing people and stuff. And huh. I was I wasn't interested, so because yeah, I got, I've got nothing good to say about the guy, you know. Well, why would you be in that case? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I decide better better not say anything about it. Just let it go, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, better, definitely. So, um, I, you are obviously active with um, Roga and, and, and Speckman Project. Um, anything on the, the death strike abomination side? Oh, you know... I'm not going to say never. I may do another Abomination album. I don't know. It's like the drummer and I haven't talked in 20 years. The guitar player died, but I wrote most of the Abomination stuff. Like, I wrote the complete first album and most of the second album, so I yes. really could technically write another album, and I'm thinking about it, but right now, mainly, I'm focusing on Master. This Speckman Project thing uh, was something special, you know, and I don't know. You'll have to ask me about that if you want to. But uh, I'm not going to say never, but my main band is, is and always will be Master, and that's what I focus on. And uh, Master will record a new album in September or October this year to be released uh, on Hammerheart Records in the spring sometime. I have maybe 15 new songs for Master that I've been working on for over two years, and I need to teach them to the guys, to the new band, and we'll go from there, you know. No, oh, cool. Definitely. So you guys, um, there's obviously, I think, especially because of the pandemic, recording has reached another level. I mean, I know so many people that, that basically you track at home. And I've talked to Bill Matoyer about this as well, <laughs> the other, not, not so long ago. And he said, you know, these days, I'm not sitting in a big studio. Um, I just get all the files and I mix. That's it. The days of you know, talking to musicians, dealing with musicians in the studio and uh, real to real, obviously. And, uh, but actually being in that space with musicians for me, definitely for me, he says for, for him are over. So my question being with everybody yeah. doing it digitally these days and uh, long distance, do you guys still go into the studio physically and hammer it out? Okay. For master, uh, we'll go in the studio face to face and do that whole record. There'll be nothing digital. The guys live here, you know? Yeah. 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 And uh, for master will always be a studio man. I'll, I'll never record online and mark my words. Never. Yeah. It's not going to happen. This is okay. You're right. It's a different world. You know, with Roga and stuff, they, he and the guys uh, digitally do their stuff and then they send me a final mix of the music. And then I, I actually still go to a studio over here in Czech and I actually sing the vocals with the mixes and send it to them and then they mix and master it and send it out, et cetera, whatever. And, uh, and that's fine. And I did the same thing with cadaveric poison. When I did that project some years back, they just sent me the music. I wrote the lyrics and sang the songs and it also came out great. Don't get me wrong, but the, project. the, the master is always better for me. Like the last record vindictive miscreant in 2018 there's always a better vibe for some reason when we do it really in a studio. So I'm never going to stop doing it that way with master. Okay. So you actually still go in the classic old way, the way I know it is actually band in studio, capture the best sort of tempo track. You do got it. Do overlays on that. And then, but that's how, we do, it. Just, that's how we do it with master. And, and for, and I'm telling you, when you listen to like that last album from 2018, and then you listen to anything I've done later with these guys online, there's a big difference, man. There's a huge you difference. Can you can feel it. You can feel that it's that we're together. So why would I why would I want to change that with master? I'm not saying that I'm not going to continue to work with other people, and I will online like we're doing, but master's always going to be a studio. I'd rather pay a studio and do it there and make sure it's really great. You know? The problem, is that, the problem for me is when these guys, when they send the stuff, it's like it's already finished. I can't say to him, well, could you do this part four more times? You know, as we're my guys, we're in the rehearsal studio practice. And then I come in two days before the studio and say, I decided to make this part eight times instead of four. And they're fine with it. We make that adjustment right now, go in the studio and record it. 
as where when I get the stuff from Roga and these other bands, whatever they want me to do stuff for them, it's written that way. And I have to write the lyrics to this song and I can't change anything. It's already done. Yes. Yes. It's very rigid. For me, that's a problem. Yeah. Look, I also toy around with stuff, but I do it more out of a hobby, but I can, as a musician, I can tell myself because, because everything is to a grid, there's little space for human error and there's little space for that. What, what I always call the, the push and pull, you know, yeah. if it's a little bit off, it's a little bit, you know, and it gets that quote unquote jerkiness, but that's not often yeah. gives, the, gives it the energy. And, the, and, the, and that's the, what I'm talking about is that everything today is uh, gotten to the point where it's too perfect. Yeah. Yeah. There's got to be, there's, like you said, there's got to be room for human error. And there is no human error on the computer. Everything is perfect, you know. That's what I found. Um, I'm, I don't want to mention names, but uh, some albums that came out recently, and I'm talking about big bands in, 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 in yeah. the metal genre, where I've just, um, I've managed through about two, three songs, and I was so put off by the, 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 s- the sterileness of, of, of the production and, and the guitar the guitars just didn't sound like, like it's a proper amp that's mic'd up or, or yeah. has no warmth. Yeah, just... <laughs> Too many samples and things, and you know, you know, this modern technology is putting a damper on it, yo. It's I mean, a... I've, been, I've been saying this for years in interviews, and I'll say it again, you know, analog was the best way to record, yo. Yes, it was so Back warm. Day, you know, you, you used to smile when, when I, like, say there was a mistake, and the guy was really good at analog and you'd watch him splice that tape with a razor blade and tape it back together to fix that little mistake. And it worked. And you would be like, wow, fucking it and But it wasn't, was like, it wasn't like a computer where you could do it like in t- two seconds. It took the guy a while to get it right. You know? And then he would tape it together, run it through. And the point is, is that back then you really knew how to play your instrument. You had to. Because if the drummer didn't get a take, you had to do it five more times until he got a take. Now... A drummer can get a take with one little missed beat or whatever, two beats, and you can fix it on the computer. Back when we were doing it, the drummer would have, we'd say, hey, dude, you got to do it again. You fucked it up. That's five times already. Can you get it down this time? You know? Exactly. I remember it was, it was like max. If you were lucky, the engineer would let you punch in here and there. Max. Right. That's what I'm trying to say. Max. They weren't about it. They would rather have you do the take again. Exactly. But a lot of times they were right, you know. Yes, they were. I'd, agree, but I'd be like, You were right, man. I'm glad we did it again. Jesus Christ, that's it. But then the other thing that was funny, too, like on the Abomination records, there's like, uh, like on the second Abomination album, there's a part where, uh, where the, the guys, you know, we played too fast. We weren't using quick click tracks back then, there were no click tracks at all, you know. Yes. And you can hear it on the you can hear it on the song, it's like, uh, the band speeded up a little bit in the middle of the riff and continued at that speed to the end. And obviously, it sounds like we did it on purpose. We didn't do it on purpose. It's fine. Who cares? Yeah. Who cares? It sounded great. Yeah. Wow. You guys speeded up halfway through the tune. What the hell happened, you know? But uh, upping the intensity, you know? Yeah, but it, but today, you know, you got that damn click track, and so there is no speeding up. You're going to play it right on that click track, and sometimes I think that makes it sterile as well. All these drummers bitch at me and say, oh, we need that click track. And I'm just like, oh, man, I, I don't know, you know. I think that click track you makes it clear. Yeah, because you're playing it perfect. And you're not feeling it. You're just playing to that computer. Do, 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 do. But also, I, it's such a weird thing. I, I, I never could get my head around is, you know, you enter studios and there's all this technology and la, 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 la. And at the end of the day, you have some kid walking around with a phone and listening through it through a mono speaker at the bottom here. Yeah. And you wonder, it's no wonder that everything is just so pre-sampled and squashed and compressed to death and sterile. Because nobody goes home and, 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 and actually has a system and, you know, it's, it's over. And I, I was really happy. I was reading an interview like a couple of weeks ago with uh, Dave Lombardo, and he said the same thing about the click track. He said, man, we had no click track in the day. And, it just made things more powerful. Things were weren't perfect all the time, but the energy was there. He's right, man. I agree with him. Absolutely he, right. He's he so was right. there, and I was there right around the same time. He had more success. We know that, but that's <laughs> not the point. But, but, but I'm just saying that's not the point. The point is, is we're on the same page, man. When he when he when I read that, I smiled. I'm like, right, exactly, Jesus. <laughs> you know? Was it Brian Slagle that made him play uh, the entire album without symbols and then add in the symbols afterwards? <laughs> 
Because there was too much spillover into the mics or something like that. <laughs> yeah, sure. Things were Crazy. different. Things were different back then, for sure. The good old days. <laughs> Definitely the good old days. Absolutely. So what? Um, oh, I'm always curious. I ask everybody this question. Uh, I have my pivotal moment in life when I just realized, okay, life will never be the same again. This thing entered my life, and I'm going to be doing this for the rest of my life. Yeah. What was it for you? Is it an album? Is it a song? Is it a someone? No, I just I always uh, I felt that uh, this was a this was a way of life, you know. It, it, you know, you go into this in this world, you know, and to the metal world. I started playing, and I never looked back. You know, I always look forward. You're okay, we were more successful in some points, some records, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but I never lost hope that I could keep playing. And getting that live feeling, whether it was five people or five thousand, I you know I always had that yeah, feeling, and definitely. I still feel it today. You know? Even with the whatever, I, I really think it was maybe seven hundred at the at that last festival. I think that I think the the guys told me they sold a thousand tickets, but only seven hundred people came. It doesn't matter. Point, you know, obviously those other three hundred people were supporting, but for me, whether it was five hundred, seven hundred, or eight, whatever, I felt the energy from the people, yo. And that is never going to go away. I don't care if there's 10 people, you know, if there's an energy there and they're having a good time, I'm going to have a good time, you know? And uh, I decided a long time ago, it was a way of life. I know many of these guys have, have jobs and it's, uh, you know, a hobby, but for me, music is a way of life and, and I live every day for it. You know, every day is not a great day either, but I'm just saying that I live for this shit, you know, and no question about it. There, there's no other other thing in, is a, this is important to me in life than my music, I'm telling you. So it wasn't uh, 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 a Lemmy riff or something that made you go, bing! Oh, you know that, what it was a really great album for me, obviously, I'm sure many people agree with that Ace of Spades or that uh, No Sleep Till Hammersmith. I saw I saw Motorhead in, in 1981 opening up for Ozzy on the Blizzard of Oz tour. I was maybe in the maybe 10th or 12th row at the Aragon Ballroom in, in Chicago. Wow. And what was really interesting, what was interesting about it that uh maybe let's say 12 rows of people were standing. Nobody really knew who Motorhead was in Chicago at that time in 1981. Motorhead took off probably two or three years later to where everyone would be standing on the chairs, let's say. But luckily, I discovered them a little bit earlier than everyone else, so I really got to enjoy that show. You know, and what's really cool is that I I, I wrote uh, Fast Eddie some years ago, obviously before he died, on Facebook, which was really interesting also to me, because he answered me, you know. It was a short, short thing, you know. I said to him, you know, I, I'd never forget seeing you guys at the Aragon 1981 in Chicago, you know, opening for Ozzy. This changed my life, I said. And he said, man, I remember that show for sure. That was a fucking excellent gig. And thank you or whatever, you know. Then another guy I wrote on Facebook, which was also weird, too, was I wrote Pete Way. You know, I wrote, I don't remember what I wrote exactly, but it's still on my Facebook. And the point is, is that both of these guys answered me, which I thought was kind of interesting because, you know, they're really famous guys, man. But in the end, they're human beings too. And sometimes I guess they just answered people. They answered me. They didn't know who I was. Of course not. It doesn't matter. But it just made me happy that even as old guys, they answered my my messages. And I, they're still on my Facebook. You know that. Oh, that's magic. Man. Not bad, but that's magic. Still, to me, that was interesting, you know? Yeah, we lost we lost some great ones there. Huh? That's yeah. Definitely. definitely. So oh, your um, plans now for the next few months? Any more concerts? You know, I, more I'm concerts? Going, yeah, I'm going to uh, France um, in May, and then I've, I've got like a weekend in France, one festival, huge festival. Um, then uh, I got a couple shows in Norway as well. A few shows every month until the end of the year, pretty much. That's what's going on. I, I don't think we'll have another really decent sized tour until the spring, probably. And also there's talk of like New Zealand and Australia, which I've never been there. 
There's also talk yeah. of an Asian, Asian tour as well next year. So I'm just, I'm waiting, you know, trying to get more dates, you know. It's finally coming back. So I'm happy about that, you know, of course. That's I'm sure everybody you know. That's yeah. Have you, you been know. to, uh, uh, have you been on the Party Sam Festival? Yeah, maybe eight or nine years ago, but they, but they, oh. never, they never invited us back yet. I don't know. The show was great. And uh, we played like a small stage or whatever. We weren't even on a big stage, but we had a full audience. It was like maybe eight o'clock at night, eight to 8.45 or something. The crowd went crazy. We had a great review. There's great pictures, tons of people. Like I said, a good nine, 10 years ago, maybe. And I had heard nothing from them. So I have to wait. You know, it's like... Uh, you have to wait for some of these people to contact you. I'm not one of those guys yeah. that's right every festival and, and ask them to play. I like to I like to think that they're going to contact me one day. And yes, exactly. You've got to wait for that. Yeah. Ah, but you, you never know who's actually the, uh, um, who does the acquisition and who uh, sort of digs around and, and decides. And, you know, it's probably also up to their whim sort of. Yeah. What what comes up? I'll tell you what is is. Um, I'm actually glad to see that a lot of these people are still around. And because um, during the pandemic, I thought, whoa, we're going to see a couple of festivals disappearing. Yeah. And uh, with all the postponements and everything getting shifted, and uh, but to my surprise, so far so good. So yeah, yeah. Many of the festivals are still here. Like I just remembered that, that festival in France in three weeks is called Courts of Chaos. And it's looking like a good one as well, you know? Okay. I'm looking forward to it. You know, for sure. But nothing beats the club show. <laughs> no, no, the club shows are great. The Spain and Portugal tour were nothing but a blast. Really great every day. I think we had maybe one crappy turnout on Tuesday, but whatever. Even during the week, the shows were really good on this tour. So it tells me that people are hungry again, anyway. At least in Spain yeah. and Portugal. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully well, the rest of the world is the same, you know? In that sense, there is something positive to be seen, you know, that people are hungry again, number one. And um, I think a lot of musicians have the chance to really mill over their new material longer and, and maybe just do yeah. some filing. Because you're also in a treadmill after a while, huh? and just churning it out also doesn't do much for the quality. So yeah. Yeah. pros, cons, I guess. Yeah, yeah, pros and cons. I agree. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, super. Not ah, cool. That pretty much covers my question side. Anything you would like to add out to the fans, to the viewers? Well, I always just like to say that, uh, you know, go out and support your local bands, man, because, you know, we all started out as local bands, and without the support of the local bands, we're never going to make it. <laughs> you know what I, mean? I always say that because, you know, I think sometimes people miss that, you know, they, They think that every band is a you know a big success, and the point is, is that you need a lot of support from the fans around the world, and especially your local fans. Man, get out and support your brothers. You know, it's a hard way of life, and we need support. That's what I always say because I think it's important. You know, no, I think a lot of people don't realize that, and especially if you, uh, even if you're Spotify, you know, I don't want to diss the whole medium, but you know, it's sort of. I try and make a point at least to try and find a band on Bandcamp or something where I know the money is going straight to the band and, you know, that's it, you know. And That's a good thing. Yeah, and I, I can only encourage everyone to do that So because it, it, it goes directly to the band and it supports the band where it's needed. And um, What I wanted, to, I wanted to say really quick is also uh, just to plug myself, go out and uh, check out the new Speckman project on Emancipation yeah. Records. It's a cool record. It's uh, really, you know, back to the old school, straightforward, hardcore punk with some surprises in there. Nice. And, uh, I think, you know, if you're into that kind of stuff, you'll like it. Give it a shot. That, that's, you know, look, just a little plug for me, you know. <laughs> I want you to, please. And um, also what I want to do, obviously, underneath the video, I'm going to post quite a few links. I'm going to take probably most of those from Metal Archives. But if there is something specific you want to um, point me the direction to, yeah, you know. Obviously, my website is uh, specmetal.net. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Everything else. I will is... definitely include that. Okay, I appreciate it, man. Thank you for the interview, of course. Cool. Good, good questions, yeah. Specmetal.net. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> Well, if you uh, happen to run across uh, Bruno, 
<laughs> in the coming yeah, days. I'll say, yeah, I'll tell him you said hello. Tell him I say hi. Yeah. So maybe hey, what, evening. what are you doing tonight? Anything? <laughs> oh, listen to metal. Do I have a few beers? Okay, me too. Have I'm gonna listen. Evening. I'm gonna thank think. I'm gonna. Much, Sorry. I said thank you very much for the interview. Of course. Hey, Paul. It's an honor. It's uh, thank you for uh, making the time. And um, yes, I think I'm gonna put on uh, an old master album and <laughs> enjoy a cold one. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. yeah, you've got the the nice Czechian beer. Yeah, a little cold as hell tonight, but okay, whatever, it's fine. Nice. Uh, that's funny. Nice. I'm gonna keep my eyes peeled. If you, um, I'm here in the vicinity of Hanover, the okay. bottom half of Hanover. So if I if I see some dates popping up, uh, I'll try to make it around to the yeah, we can live be the first ones, yo. To yeah. the live proceedings, yes. All right, Mister. Thank you very much. Good evening, yo. Have a good one. Cheers, Paul. You too.